I'm going to start by sharing a few pictures with you. I put up a couple pictures on uh, Facebook a few weeks ago. And there's one picture in particular that people just loved to see. There's a picture on the left. And so this is a picture of Chelsea and I as we were dating in my early 20s. And I think Chelsea was 19 still there in that picture. But I want to share this with you because I've shared the story before. Uh, so many of you have probably heard the story of me coming home from uh, college one day and telling Chelsea that I think I'm going to be a preacher. Anyone remember what Chelsea's response was? What did Chelsea do when I told her I'm called to become a preacher? She laughed at me. <laughs> And she wasn't trying to be mean. She actually thought it was a joke. <laughs> I told her I was going to be a preacher, and she laughed at me. The reason that she laughed and thought that that was a joke was because who I was about 14, 15 years ago, the thought of being a preacher was about the farthest thing from being a reality. It was about the strangest thing that you could uh, probably imagine me choosing to do. She was a little shocked. Anyone else here feel that way sometimes? That if you were to tell someone, I'm going to be a preacher, they might laugh at you. Maybe you feel it in, within yourself. Maybe you've heard that voice and you've thought, no. How many of you think that you might get laughed at or you might laugh at yourself if you thought you were going to be a preacher? Being honest. <laughs> some, I think some of us are there. Do we feel like a, do we feel like a preacher? I'm still starting to, I'm still trying to feel like I'm really a preacher, <laughs> like I'm really a pastor. And the reason for that, I, I won't go into my whole story, but the reason is of who I, who I used to be, where my heart used to be. We read a text from Philippians this past week in a small group, and it talks about this uh, doing everything without selfish ambition. And if you could describe who I was before I met Christ, it was doing everything for my selfish ambition and my gain. I had no concern in the world for anyone other than myself. And I know that humanity struggles with that, and all of us have that within ourselves. But I had an extra measure of that. And I don't know what it was from growing up, uh, from the experiences I had in life, but I had no concern for anyone but myself to the extent in which, you know, I don't even think my family enjoyed my presence, presence too much. They're still trying to learn to enjoy my presence, but um, I just wasn't a pleasant person. Yet I came home one day telling Chelsea I was going to become a preacher. This, this picture on the left is, is a man named Velo. And so a few years after this picture on the left, or on your left, um, Chelsea and I are, were on a mission trip in Northern Europe in a country called Estonia. And we were participating in a ministry where we had one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, locals in the country, uh, helping them to practice their English by reading the Bible. And so they would sometimes reluctantly come to read the Bible with us, and we'd have conversations about the Bible. And this was their opportunity to speak to a, a Canadian or to an English speaker and practice their English, because English is something that they desire. And so you have all these one-on-one -on -one conversations, and you read the Bible, and you have these incredible conversations, actually, about your faith, and have to quite often uh, answer many questions. But I'd share a picture of Vela with you. Vela was a Moravian uh, brethren priest, uh, starting from his, in his early 20s, um, when, which was late 1930s, uh, right into World War II. He had some incredible stories uh, from the, when all of that happened. But... I want to share this picture of Vela with you uh, because there was a moment, and this was like one of those, I don't know if you've ever had these life-shifting moments that you can remember. It's like something just sparked in your heart, and then from that, that point forward, things were different. Velo, one time, as we were leaving our little one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, he said to me, goodbye, Apostle Peter. He called me Apostle Peter. And this, just remembering who I was at that time, even on a mission trip, uh, kind of there because I wanted to travel. I, th I actually rejected his address as calling me Apostle Peter. I said, I'm not an apostle. And he actually very sternly, not really rebuked me, but very sternly and very seriously looked me in the eye and he said, Peter, you are an apostle. I said, we're all apostles and you are here bringing the good news of Jesus. And I will keep calling you Apostle Peter. And then he left. <laughs> 
And that might seem inconsequential, but that was just a moment in which something, some bell rang in my, my brain. And it was where God and the, His Spirit convicted my heart and my mind and my whole being. I can preach God's Word. I can share God's Word. I am able, I am capable through Jesus to be an apostle. See, I'd always, even though I had made a decision to become a preacher, felt unworthy, and I still often do. But the reality is that we are all called to become apostles sharing God's Word. So there's this moment. Have anyone here ever had that moment where you've realized, I can do this. I can be a part of spreading, you know, glorifying God and spreading his kingdom. If you haven't had this moment, then I just want to encourage you. I, want, I really want to encourage all of us. Just as we're about to read this text, and, and what I'm going to share afterwards, just, there's nothing groundbreaking, um, and hopefully it will be brief. But I just want to encourage you to open up your mind right now, open up your heart and be able to hear. I think too often when we open scripture, we open it with a closed heart and a closed mind. And we're not really ready. We're not ready for God to speak to our hearts. We're not ready for God to change us and to move us. And I know that I'm often there. And so I just want to encourage you, please open your heart, open your mind. We're going to continue in the Gospel of Mark this morning. Jamie's been taking us through this, and I, I love that we're going through the Gospel of Mark this year. We're unraveling the, the true identity. I think in today's world, there's just nothing more important that we should focus on than unraveling and uncovering and proclaiming, re-cementing our foundation in who Jesus is. Jesus is the salvation of the world and who our identity is as followers. And so let's, we're going to move into the first section of Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of Mark today. And we're going to read a series of parables. There's a few of these. So before we read them, I want to read for you from this book called Parables of Jesus. Uh, Gary Inrig wrote a book about the parables, describing many of them and detailing them. And in it he said this about parables. The American playwright are author, sorry, Arthur Miller once observed, in every su successful drama, there's something which makes a person say, hey, that's me. The story becomes a mirror in which self-recognition produces self-understanding. Many of the stories the Lord Jesus told have precisely that effect. They're a mirror. To read them properly is to see ourselves, but they are, are more than mirrors. They almost always become windows into the heart and mind of God himself. As a result, they do far more than reveal who we are. They help us know who God is. Is. They not only expose our condition, but also point to a divine remedy. They expose our condition, point to a divine remedy. And so as we read through these, just think of these in this way. I love this, this image that he gives of parables being both a mirror to see ourselves in this story, but also a window into who God is and who we are. And so let's go ahead. We're going to go from starting in Mark chapter 4 and in, starting in verse 3. Listen. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. I'm going to say before I read this, because I know probably many of you have read this text many times before, but um, I often have the habit of, if I'm reading a familiar text, I just start thinking ahead, and I, I already know this text, I'm thinking about it. Please just kind of, if we can, just pause. Let's just listen to this, this text, as the listeners would have heard Jesus preaching. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they, were, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Jesus later explains this parable. He says, The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown in good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. Later in Mark 4, verse 21, Jesus speaks of a lamp. He said to them, do you, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? 
Instead, you put it on its stand. For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Then Jesus speaks of a harvest. In verse 26, he also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And then in verse 30, he speaks of the mustard seed. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big, big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. And so we read these four uh, parables or stories that Jesus tells. What is he teaching here? What is Jesus trying to say through these parables? There's actually a lot that these stories cause us to reflect on. Um, there's, there's quite a few things that come to mind. If we're thinking of the parables in regards to them being a mirror or a window, I think the first place we often, when we're reading a parable, is we, we look at them as a mirror. We try to see ourselves in it. And this is often what has, I think, the question that comes to our mind in this, especially the parable of the sower, is what kind of soil are you? And so we, we should reflect on this. What kind of soil are you? Are you uh, the path? Uh, is your heart hard? Is the, the kingdom of God breaking into the world through Jesus? In other words, these seeds that Jesus is talking about, which is the news of the, the gospel, the good news, or the news that the kingdom is breaking into the world through Jesus. Is this able to grow in your heart, or are you on a hard path? Um, are you digging deep roots, or is there, are there stones? Is there stony ground within you? Do you have thorns? that are choking out the word as it attempts to grow in your life? Or is, are you good soil? I, I have often, and I, I especially um, for many years, thought about this and thought about what soil I am. And you may, as I th say that, think I'm this soil or I'm that soil. But I want to caution you against thinking that you're one soil. The reality is that we're most likely every person has every one of these soils within them, different parts of their heart, different parts of their lives that are each of these. Don't make the mistake of thinking you're one soil. Have you toiled within yourself to allow deeper or stronger roots? Have you been toiling in response to what Jesus shares here within yourself to allow deeper or stronger roots to take place? What kind of thorns do you have in your life? Are there ways that you can toil the soil of your heart in order for the word to produce a harvest within you and through you. We might think this is the type of soil that I am. And if we do have stony ground, if we are a hard path, if we do have thorns, what do we do in order to toil that soil to make it good soil so that the word of God can grow in us? All of these are legitimate, they're important things to consider in response to this parable. Yet, if this is all we reflect on in response to these parables, I think we've neglected one vital element. And so often, and even I've preached this uh, parable before, and I've often really focused in on what kind of soil are you, but I don't think that's necessarily the point, the overall purpose, the big thing Jesus is saying here especially as we read all of these. There's one common th thread that's throughout all of these parables, and I believe too often it's neglected or missed altogether. It's not some hidden meaning. It's not a new revelation. It's actually quite obvious, and here it is. This is what I believe Jesus is saying to his apostles, to his followers, and it's this. Cast seeds. Cast seeds. Cast seeds. Go out and cast seeds. And God will produce a harvest. If you cast seeds, God will produce a harvest. If you're going to produce a harvest, seeds must be cast. So go out and cast seeds. Is Jesus saying in this uh, text here that in order for us to simply, is he wanting us to simply reflect on what kind of soil we are? 
and what kind of soil others are. I, I think it's quite fitting and, and probably pretty common. We often, when we're reading scripture, we just kind of put ourselves into the, our, and we think of ourselves. But just think about these parables that we just read. We're introduced to seeds in the parable of the sower, right? There are seeds being cast. These seeds are the kingdom of God breaking into the world through Jesus. Then he speaks of a lamp. He's speaking of a lamp. And we're told that everything that's hidden is meant to be revealed. And he's speaking of him, him, the light of the world. That it is, it is meant to be revealed. It is meant to be brought out into the open. He speaks of a farmer. A farmer who, no matter what he does, he goes and he sleeps. Yet the harvest grows. He just plants the seeds and the harvest grows. And then we read of a tree uh, this mustard seed that grows into a tree so big that birds can perch in its branches. No matter how small the seed is, it grows. We hear in these parables of Jesus that regardless of the scenario, a, a harvest comes. A harvest is produced. No matter all the different kinds of soil, keeping in mind as Jesus told this parable of the sower, there were so many, he says there were so many people that he had to take a boat, go out into the water because there just wasn't room on shore, so he's preaching from the water. There's people everywhere. But Jesus is saying that no matter what kind of soils there are, cast seeds, cast seeds. Yes, some fall on the path, and they don't grow. Some do fall on stony ground, and they don't have deep roots, and those plants wither, and some are choked out by weeds, but some fall on good soil and produce a harvest, and it's multiplied. We learn of a farmer who plants seed, and no matter what he does, even while he sleeps, it grows, it multiplies, the harvest is produced. And no matter how small a seed is, this, he says the kingdom of God is like this small mustard seed. No matter how small that is, it grows up and becomes a big tree. Don't miss one very important truth we learn about the kingdom of God that we're now a part of, and that we're commissioned by Christ to grow. When seeds are planted, a harvest is produced. When seeds are planted, <laughs> the seeds of the kingdom of God are planted, a harvest is produced. Also don't miss or neglect the very obvious, obvious truth that for harvest to come, seeds must be planted. Seeds must be planted. Jesus teaches his disciples, the ones that he's going to leave responsible for the growth of his kingdom, to become farmers, casting seed. Uh, I love the way that the message describes in the, the, the mustard seed. So Eugene Peterson, as he wrote in his paraphrased Bible, uh, in this text, for the mustard seed, he used a pine nut and a pine tree as an example. Because in North America, we probably don't plant or see these mustard trees very often. But he uses the example of a pine tree and a pine nut, which I, I love because, as you know, I love nature and I love hiking. And, and one of the things that I often do, it's one of the nerdy things, one of the many th nerdy things, about me. I don't know if you've ever just found yourself sitting there and just staring at like a leaf or staring at something for quite a while and amazed at it. I often will look at these little tiny trees that are growing in the most random and rare and incredible places and just kind of just think about how, how did that get there? How is it surviving? Uh, but the, the pine tree, it casts seeds. It, it actually doesn't have a choice to do this. It's part of what, it, of, of it's, it's what pine trees do. They cast seeds. They cast seeds all of the time. And no matter what, it's part of their identity. And do all those seeds grow? No, actually, they, they don't. They cast seeds all the time. Yet, pine trees just cover the earth. I'm always amazed in a forest. Like, just where did these trees all come from? And looking at some of the most bizarre places these trees grow. Um, are you seeking a harvest? And are you casting seeds? Um, I, I asked you at the very beginning, you know, when describing who I used to be and how Chelsea thought it was hilarious that I would be a preacher. Is that you? If that's you this morning, I want you to know that if, you're, if you, you've chosen to follow Jesus, if, you are, uh, if you've given your life to him, if you love Jesus Christ, if you desire to honor Jesus with your life, if you want to follow after him, which is by definition what being a Christian is, then cast seeds. Become a farmer. Cast seeds.
You might think as I shared the story of Velo telling me that I'm, a, I'm, I'm an apostle, you might think, oh, Peter, you're a pastor. So yeah, you are an apostle. Or you're Peter, you're, look, you're a preacher. So of course you can say that you, know, you were convicted to, that you were able to preach, preach God's word. But I am no one. I was no one and I'm still no one. I don't have any ability. I'm not strong. I don't have confidence. I'm not especially gifted or talented apart from the Spirit of God. Those who are called to follow Jesus Christ are called to go out and to cast the seed of the kingdom of God into this world to continue planting seeds. And so that's basically all I will ask you this morning is, are you casting seeds? Where are you planting seeds? And I'm going to give you three things a little bit more focused in order to kind of guide you in this, you know, considering, am I doing this? How do I do this? Uh, where can I begin? Because if you're like me, or especially like I was, you might be thinking, not me. Why would God ever want me to go into cast to cast seeds? There's no chance if I were to attempt to go plant the seed of the kingdom in someone's heart that that would produce fruit. But don't miss what Jesus says. If you plant seeds, a harvest will be produced. How does that happen? Number one is don't focus on fruit. Don't focus on fruit. What do I mean by this? Don't focus on the harvest. Too often, I have to thank Allie for this. In group a few weeks ago, she said this. I, just, I think too often we focus on the fruit. And I agree. Because too often I think we're focused on success. We're evaluating whether I should continue, whether I'm doing this, whether I'm good at this, whether I'm doing the right thing when it comes to God's kingdom and being a follower of Jesus on whether or not we're successful. How do we define success? Too often we just focus in on the fruit. Let me read for you 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 7. What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? This is Paul speaking. Only servants, they're through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. I'll read verse 7 again. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. And of course, you've likely read or heard, I think Jamie actually spoke of this a few weeks ago, John 15, verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the true vine. We are simply branches attached to that true vine. And if we are deeply rooted in that vine, we will produce fruit. But apart from him, we can do nothing. Don't focus on fruit. Focus on Jesus. If our focus is on, am I going to be successful? Is this person going to come to believe Christ? Is this person going to come to church if I invite them to church? Is this person, if I, and when I'm at work or in whatever, sitting for dinner with this friend, if I open up about my faith and they don't immediately fall before Jesus and give their life to Jesus and... Should I keep doing this? We're so focused on what's going to happen when what we really need to do is just trust in Jesus, follow him, and cast seeds. Cast seeds. Just keep casting seeds. God is not asking you to be successful. God is asking us to be faithful, to trust in him, the true vine. Just keep casting seeds. If we're going to produce a harvest for the kingdom of God, we need to be rooted in Jesus. Don't focus on the fruit. Focus on Jesus. Number two is start a list. Grab a pen, grab a piece of paper, and I just want to encourage you to start a list. What kind of list? Actually, two lists. <laughs> but I want you to think. Can you name one person right now who is not a Christian in which you are intentionally building relationship with you are dedicating time in order to be with them. You're investing yourself in them. You are, you're investing part of your life in this person. They're not a Christian. They're not a member of the church. Can you think of someone? And I just want to actually, first, before you start, just draw a line down the middle of your paper. 
draw a line down the middle of your paper on the left side. Go ahead, and if you can think of someone, someone who's not a Christian, not just someone who's not a Christian, but someone who's not a Christian who you're intentionally seeking after. You're seeking relationship with them. You're dedicating time in order to be with them, investing yourself in them. If you have lots of them, just write four or five down, maybe. If you have none, if you can't think of someone who you're intentionally trying to plant seeds in their life, seeds of the kingdom, then just go ahead and put a question mark on that side. Put a question mark there. I want to encourage you to consider where are you casting seed? Where are you casting seed? Not where do you see fruit. Not where have you seen success. But where are you casting seed? And then on your right side of your paper, uh, I want you to consider to think about people that are within the church, within the body of Christ. Someone who is a follower of Jesus. Can you name one person inside the church? that you've sought out a relationship with. Uh, you've intentionally built a relationship with them. You're dedicating time in order to be with them. You're, I shouldn't say sacrificing, because it's not a sacrifice. It's an investment of time, a giving of your life in order to be with them, in order to plant seeds of the kingdom, allow seeds to grow within them. Again, if you, have, if you have a number, just, just write four or five down. If you don't have any, then just put a question mark. I think far too often the focus of our relationships in church is for our benefit. We might have some people we can think of that we obviously know really well. and We spend lots of time with them. But I really want to encourage you and challenge you to consider the motivation behind the relationships that you have, not just outside of the church, but also in, in the church. Far too often in both areas, our motivation is ourself. What can these people offer me? What can I gain from them? But we as followers of Jesus Christ are equipped with the love of Jesus Christ. Because he loves us, now we love not only him but the world. And we are equipped with this love and called to go and to pour this out in the world. And to go plant seeds of the kingdom regardless of whether our name is title is pastor or our title is accountant or our title is whatever it is that you do. I'm a stay-at-home mom. You're called as a follower of Jesus Christ to go and to cast seed. I'll get back to that list in just a moment. But number three is time for a career change. Um, our identity must, it must change. And I think very often... I think very often we lose track as we are living as Christians in this world. And I think this is seen by people outside the church quite often too. But we lose track with our true identity. Our life often revolves around what we do for a living, right? What is my career? This is how we identify ourselves. If someone were to ask us, you know, what do you do or who are you? you would immediately think of your job or your career. Your life certainly does revolve around your job. And of course, that is necessary to pay bills and to live and to be involved in society. But our life doesn't revolve around what job we do for money. Our life should adapt to revolve around planting the seed of the kingdom of God, breaking through into our world through Jesus. And the good news is this, that we don't have to quit our jobs. We don't have to change our careers. We can have this new identity as followers of Jesus, planting seeds of the kingdom in people's hearts, wherever we find ourselves. And so whether we're a computer technician, whether we're an engineer, whatever it is that we do, I'm an administrative assistant. Our true identity as followers of Jesus Christ is to plant seeds, just to go and grow the kingdom of God. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm his. How can I apply that wherever I am? No matter where I am, what I do, I am this. I am a seed planter and I'm planting seeds. Remember the pine tree. You probably tuned out when I started talking about how much I am fascinated by nature. But if you didn't and you heard that, remember the pine tree, how it covers the earth. They don't meticulously go down knowing exactly what they're doing, carefully digging out the soil and planting their little seeds. They just, they just throw seeds every year all the time. That's who they are. And that's who we should be as Christians. I, I told you I'd get back to that list. I'm going to end here with a prayer time and allowing you some time to pray. Or, to pray, sorry. Uh, and just allow us all.
to spend some time in prayer. And I had you make that list for uh, for a reason. I hope that you, you know, maybe you don't take that home or maybe you lose it, but, you know, it's, the list is just a silly thing. I hope it got you considering, who do I have in my life right now? Have I really intentionally established relationships with people? Am I doing this? Because I think we should be purposeful about it, but... And especially if, if, if what you have on one of the sides of those papers is a question mark, then that question mark stands for this prayer, who? Who? And I encourage you to pray that prayer, simply just, who God? Who? And to, to walk about and to go about your day and your life, asking God that question, who? Where can I plant seeds? Draw closer to Jesus. Pray over your list. And surrender to your new career and seek guidance. So let's just go ahead and close in prayer. And I'm just going to leave you with uh, some silence for a few moments. And then I'll close us in about a minute. 